Welcome everyone. My name is Dana White. I'm the host of the Myth Salon and pursuant to labyrinths, I served on the dissertation committee of Dr. Dennis Hall doing something on labyrinths and it's just opened up a, a massive groundswell of labyrinth involvement that I, I just was unforeseen. Uh, we got Dr. Lauren Arntress to come in uh, for a myth salon that we wanted to do with Denny. And then I met Carmel and I met Don. I mean, they asked us about hosting what we call now Love and the Labyrinth. And the reason for that is that reality is driven by love and strife goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks. And the idea is that in a in a can any kind of a journey or an intellectual or an emotional pursuit, there's love behind it. You go into the labyrinth and you basically follow yourself down this path. It's not I it's not a maze, you don't get lost. And the whole idea of this is to awaken that sense of yourself within yourself. So what I'd like to do first is I'd like to read a poem to get us going in, the, in this. And it, it's called The Labyrinth. And think of the center of the labyrinth as a, as a cadenza in a, in, a, in a musical piece. And a cadenza is it's a passage where it's inserted into a concerto where the orchestra stops playing and it leaves the soloist free to improvise. We're all musicians in our, in our own worlds. So here's a poem called The Labyrinth. I discovered the gods governing existence when I found myself in a cadenza, in the labyrinth that is my soul's journey. I recognize the call that emerges when things change or with departure from the path. The gods freely move about in the open space of the cadenza, for they are not framed by paths or particular ways of being. Paths make things clear, where I am headed, how far I have come. The gods reveal themselves in a cadenza, in the stillness, in the sacred space. And until the first notes of my original nature start the song, there is silence. The silence is breathtaking a stark contrast to the lyric of the path that always tells me which way to go. Only the way spiraling into myself will complete the journey. This labyrinth has become my life's work. The notes of the song emerging from the cadenza are my own. I aim my stride down the only path I can see for I have been given the compass I already owned. The cadenza slips from experience into memory. The path that brought me here is no longer visible, but I am immersed in curiosity, trust, and the love of adventure, longing to arrive at a place I do not know. Though I realize when I arrive, I will recognize it as feeling like home. All I can do is journey to the end where I know it will become apparent. I must begin the journey again, as empty as a newborn. Armed with my song, am I singing the song? Or is the song singing me? Have I done this before? I do not know. 
The only thing familiar is this song. The way onward is in. Yeah. Beautiful. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being part of this introduction to World Labyrinth Day, which is coming up on May 4th. And right now, I'm going to turn this over to the entire panel of these labyrinth organizations. They're all over. They're, we're all over the world, all over the United States. So I want to introduce first Ellen Much, who lives in Wheaton, Illinois. She has been dedicated to using the labyrinth to help individuals, communities, and the world since 2001 when she became a Veritas certified facilitator. Originally, she focused her labyrinth energy on helping people who were incarcerated. In 2005, she founded the Global Healing Response, a plan that helps the labyrinth community respond to disasters and emergency in a unified way. Since 2020, Ellen has served as the coordinator for World Labyrinth Day. Next up, I want to introduce Don Matheny, who is a seasoned administrator who has worked for over 30 years running local governments and nonprofits. Don got involved with the labyrinth by attending and then assisting with Women's Dream Quest with strong administrative, organizational, and people skills Don is delighted to be building Veritas to spread the work of Lauren Artress in promoting labyrinths as a psycho-spiritual tool. Next, I would like to introduce Carmel Stabley. She serves on the Executive Board of Directors for the Labyrinth Society and has been chairperson since 2016, working in areas of community building and membership while developing a global network of regional representatives. She also serves on the committee for World Labyrinth Day. The labyrinth has woven its way into Ange Vergona's vocation over the past 12 years. His visit to Chart in 2012 was a pivotal experience. The labyrinth is a daily pilgrimage. Chris Katzenmeier is the executive director of the Legacy Labyrinth Project an international organization dedicated to connecting labyrinths around the world to be able to take action to bring about change that is not possible in traditional ways. She has led labyrinth walks for over 21 years and has a labyrinth ministry in Denver, Colorado. Scott Hensley leads monthly labyrinth walks and photographs labyrinths around the Southwest United States. He is currently the Labyrinth Society Regional Representative for Nevada and is the Regional Rep Coordinator for the Labyrinth Society Regional Reps Worldwide. Susie Leiper is the Labyrinth Society Membership Chairperson and also Regional Rep Liaison for the Northwest USA Eastern Canada regions. She has a winter home and a labyrinth outreach in Honduras. After all of that, welcome everyone. I'd like to turn it over now to Ellen Muge. Go for it. I'm dying to hear about World Labyrinth Day. Well, I hope that you can see that we're in great company with some wonderful people here tonight. And um, I'm lucky enough to be the chairman of World Labyrinth Day and have these people on my steering committee. They're fantastic and we have a good time. So I appreciate everything they do and um, it makes my life really easy. So thank you for those wonderful introductions. We're so happy to be here and to let people know about World Labyrinth Day, invite you and um, welcome you to participate. Um, Dana, I'm so glad that you we welcome you into the Labyrinth community and your enthusiasm and your beautiful poem. So thank you for that. I would like to pass it over to Dawn right now. She's going to do a little intro into the Labyrinth before we get into what World Labyrinth Day is after that. 
So Don, I pass it over to you. Wonderful. I wanted to take you all to the basics about that a labyrinth is a meandering path, often single and unicursal, where the path leads to the center. Unlike a maze with forced choices and dead ends, a labyrinth is designed for you to find your way and a maze is designed to make you lose your way. So the labyrinth um, has quite a history. It isn't something new age. Um, what we're looking at in this picture right here is the labyrinth in Chartres Cathedral in France, and it dates back to 1201. There are many ways to use the labyrinth, and there are many labyrinth patterns out there. So what you're seeing here is a classical labyrinth uh, in Sweden, very different from the Chartres labyrinth. Um, it's an ancient archetype that dates back over 4,000 years, and it's used symbolically as a walking meditation as a path of prayer, as a ceremonial site, and more. Labyrinths create time and space and psych for psychological and spiritual connection and transformation. They offer an embodied practice for connecting to yourself uh, and the surroundings and connecting to others. And I think this picture taken on Vancouver Island, uh, BC, Canada, uh, shows a group of people um, either beginning or ending a labyrinth walk. Um, labyrinths evoke metaphor, a sense of the sacred, religious practice, spiritual journey, mindfulness, well-being, and community building. Now, here are many ways you can refer to a labyrinth, a crucible of change, a journey through time and space, a watering hole for the spirit, a sure path in uncertain times, a field of light, a path to your deepest wisdom, a blueprint where psyche meets spirit, a mirror of the soul, an open source archetype, a walking meditation, a metaphor for the path of life, a cosmic dance, a path of prayer, a portal to the sacred, and a divine imprint. So you can create a labyrinth wherever you are, um, in a variety of different ways. You can do it on your toenails or <laughs> you can do it on the beach. Um, you can do it in your backyard or at a park. Um, labyrinths have, are multiplying and they are everywhere. You can also create a um, the, a labyrinth pattern that you trace with your finger. Uh, some people call it a finger labyrinth uh, walk um, or a handheld labyrinth walk. Um, during the pandemic, we had to, Veriditas had to go to finger labyrinths or handheld labyrinth walks because we uh, stopped doing things in person for a while. Um, but uh, that's beginning to change and we're offering more events in person now. Um, the labyrinth, there's no better place for ceremony or ritual. You can share uh, with a group, mark a point in time or create a personal ritual. You can see that uh, there was a picture from Devon, England, from uh, British Columbia, and from Queensland, Australia. 
Um, lab, you'll find the labyrinths everywhere. And as we talk about uh, resources, um, we have on our website and on the TLS website, uh, the World Wide Labyrinth Locator, where you can find a labyrinth that's near, near you. Labyrinths do come in all sizes and shapes and de designs and materials. You'll see one on a hardwood floor and one made with rocks uh, outside. Um, it can be a solo walk or a group walk. A shared walk at an open walk, people arrive and depart at any time during the event. And at a group walk, they arrive at the same time, walk together and hold space for one another before departing. Um, one of the things Veriditas is known for is uh, um, our training program. And we do train facilitators to um, host labyrinth walks. A facilitator can manage the flow of participants into the labyrinth, also can help shape the experience of a walk by making it a themed walk or introducing um, some poetry at the beginning. Um, have You can have music playing or not. There are just so many ways to do it. And here is the Blue Labyrinth Bush Retreat in Australia. One of the um, ways of walking the labyrinth follows the three or four R's. And what you see here is the four R's of releasing, receiving, returning, and remembering. Nothing too formal about this, except that it gives you a rhythm for walking the labyrinth. You can um, see the different the different designs um, outlined here. The 11 circuit medieval shark style is in the middle. The classical labyrinth has um, goes back even earlier than the medieval labyrinth. This is a design you can find in caves. And this is a, a seven circuit contemporary uh, professional, processional labyrinth where you can enter from one direction and leave from the other. So I hope that gives you a taste of what labyrinths are and the many ways that you can use labyrinths. Thank you, Dawn. That was a great introduction and um, your viewers might want to stay open to this because it's been said many times that once you get exposed to a labyrinth like this, you might start hearing about them more. You might start seeing them. They'll pop up in places you haven't expected. So keep your mind open. There's actually nothing you have to know to walk a labyrinth, but Dawn did a great job in um, introducing and giving you a little information about what you can do and what you can know about walking a labyrinth. So now we'd like to talk a little bit more about World Labyrinth Day, which as Dana said, happens on the first Saturday in May, on May 4th. And we're gonna give you the who, what, where, when, and why about World Labyrinth Day. I just wanted to talk and um, brag just a little bit about our four organizations that collaborate together. The first one is the Labyrinth Society, um, as you heard about, and in two, they founded it, and Carmel's going to talk more about that in a little while. Australian Labyrinth Network joined in in 2019, and then in 2021, the Legacy Labyrinth Project and Veritas joined in to collaborate. And we have been, over the years since 2021, we've really made an effort to make it very, very, very global, and you'll hear how we've done that 
in a, in a few minutes. Um, we want everyone to feel welcome all around the world. And as you'll see from our video at the end, it is very moving that we walk as one at one that begins in New Zealand and ends in Hawaii. And everyone at one o'clock walks from east to west. And we create a wave of peace around the world on May 4th and show the world it's possible. So Carmel, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Scott, I think you can go to the next slide and um, I'll let Carmel take it away. Thank you, Ellen. Carmel Stavely. It's so good to be with you all tonight. I'm gonna to give you a little backstory about TLS and World Labyrinth Day. Since 1998, the Labyrinth Society, fondly known as TLS, has served the worldwide labyrinth community by supporting all those who create, maintain, and use labyrinths by providing education, networking, and opportunities to experience transformation and community. The Labyrinth Society weaves connections throughout the global labyrinth community with resources and events such as World Labyrinth Day. The purpose of World Labyrinth Day held on the first Saturday in May each year is to bring people from all over the planet together in celebration of labyrinth walking as a practice, symbol, or tool for peace. Participants are encouraged to walk as one at one o'clock in their time zone to create a wave of peaceful energy around our planet. By connecting across time zones, we create a ripple of peace for planetary healing. The celebration starts in New Zealand and ends in Hawaii with this ripple effect around the world from east to west. It is truly a wave of peaceful energy circling the earth. We want you to know that World Labyrinth Day in educational settings is celebrated on May the 3rd. And we're going to be hearing a little bit more about that later. And this year on May the 4th is the Worldwide Labyrinth Day Walk. World Labyrinth Day is an opportunity to inform and educate the public. Host walks, build permanent or temporary labyrinths, create labyrinth art, or explore the archetype in other ways for personal and global transformation. Throughout the ages, people have sought out the gifts of the labyrinth during times of trial. Many parts of our world are under siege. People are traumatized, suffering, and our planet suffers too. We walk with purpose for these people and our suffering planet to raise awareness, to harmonize energy, and to engage intention, faith, and prayer. World Labyrinth Day is as much a celebration as it is an act of sacred activism. So World Labyrinth Day is an annual event and it was founded and sponsored by the Labyrinth Society. Um, the first World Labyrinth Day was planned in 2008 at the TLS fall meeting. An international committee of 19 members chose the first Saturday in May as World Labyrinth Day. 2024 is our 16th year. Every year on the first Saturday in May, thousands of people around the world participate in this moving meditation for world peace. I can remember a really unique World Labyrinth Day back in 2020 during the isolation of COVID-19 pandemic. TLS offered a 24 hour virtual World Labyrinth Day event. It was called Walk Around the World. Hundreds and thousands of participants engaged engaged in this Zoom that was all night long. And many of us stayed up all night long uh, to listen to the uh, engaging presenters that um, stayed up through the wee hours. More about our partners. In 2019, World Labyrinth Day in educational settings was initiated by the Australian Labyrinth Network, known as ALN. It was in collaboration with the Labyrinth Society. Then in 2021, TLS and ALN partnered with Veritas and the Legacy Labyrinth Project to bring together engaging events, labyrinth-based research known as the Big Connection, helpful resources, and a vibrant new website dedicated to World Labyrinth Day. 
the website will be in the chat box. It's worldlabyrinthday.org and you spell the whole thing out. In 2022 and 2023, the partners continued to provide pre-World Labyrinth Day events, updated resources, and a second and third Big Connection resource project. This year, we have added a pre-World Labyrinth Day in intention, which we will practice together later. We also translated our basic flyer into 12 different languages. We hope to add ASL and Braille in the future. Members and friends of TLS from around the world also connect virtually in our thriving Facebook community, engaging over 20,000 participants. TLS also serves as a connection to the Worldwide Labyrinth Locator, a comprehensive database which provides GPS coordinates to more than 6,000 public and private labyrinths around the world. During May of last year, the Labyrinth Locator had approximately 17,500 visits from over 12,700 users, largely due to World Labyrinth Day. So that's a bit about our history. Uh, this history can only continue as you join us in these walks. And we trust that you'll walk with us at one o'clock in your time frame. Back to you, Ellen. Thanks. Um, now I have the opportunity to pass it over to Ange who is representing the Australian Labyrinth Network and was key in creating the resources for World Labyrinth Day in educational settings. So, Ange, take it away. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your warm welcome. And it's certainly an honour representing the Australian Labyrinth Network. Um, in particular, um, to share resources gathered and developed with um, two of my colleagues, Louise Mason and Therese Welsh, who together we form the um, educational settings arm of the Australian Labyrinth Network. We celebrate um, World Labyrinth Day in educational settings on the Friday before World Labyrinth Day. It's a great opportunity to catch our um, budding uh, labyrinth lovers in an early stage. Our focus this year is titled Peaceful Labyrinths 2. Um, a bit of a play on words as there's a flow on from the Peaceful Hearts theme that we had in 2023. In 2023, we had a focus developing um, extra ideas for the uh, finger labyrinth use. As you can imagine in our um, school settings, not many have the opportunity to have a portable labyrinth, let alone the privilege of a permanent labyrinth on their school sites. So uh, along with this focus of finger labyrinth use, uh, we introduced and stressed the concept of heartfulness inspired by the heart math coherence. Our development for 2024 was to associate key values that you could align with peaceful hearts. The prepared activities for 2024 um, do not stand alone and are certainly not conditional of participation or sharing in the activities based on the 2023 theme. So basically, um, at the end of this, I'd like to encourage you um, to view the extensive resources that we've document, documented and gathered on the ALM website. Um, we actually um, nicknamed it our grab bag of resources, our one-shop stop. So certainly um, I'm hoping that you, uh, the resources that we have um, highlighted something for labyrinth lovers, but please, they are not locked in for those in educational settings or educators. So um, what are our hopes? I suppose we hope to reach out to as many educational settings, and I guess in the long term, everyone, so uh, our focus has been into our public and state schools, our special learning schools, our religious-based schools, Montessori, Rudolf Steiner schools, um, homeschooling, which has been a marked development here since COVID, um, online school programs, early learning centres for our preschool children, college, university, and um, all the resources that we have can be easily adapted to all. Um, a bit of self-indulgence that excites me greatly is um, the slide in the top left-hand corner is a, a new permanent slide installed on the school, as is the one in the bottom left-hand corner. So it's uh, much excitement that we're having um, permanent sites being built, uh, and we currently have a, a third one being installed. So our um, 2024 theme, Peaceful Hearts 2. Um, we introduced... Um, or inviting people to use their heartfulness practices through nine core values. 
um, we focus very strongly on that sense of intentionality for the labyrinth. We certainly encourage that heart-brain co connection and um, many ideas, again, in the resource pack that we hope you um, look at uh, are strategies in reference to the work of the Legacy Labyrinth and the HeartMath Institute. Uh, with our um, students uh, at whatever age, um, breathing techniques also encouraged. Um, from the two images, um, you certainly you can see the senior school, but in the uh, right bottom right hand corner, they're junior school students. Um, that image is taken of um, seven year olds and who do the heart math focus um, before they enter the labyrinth at the center and then again when they exit. It, it really aligns very much with the three parts of the, the labyrinth and um, such joy in watching um, seven year olds know exactly um, how to walk a labyrinth and participate in the heart coherence. So the key values that we focus on um, in our uh, resources are love, forgiveness, care, respect, kindness, compassion, and cooperation. Um, th the list is endless, but that was our focus um, for this year. Again, we encourage if you choose to the part of value that I think really reflects the time and place of your community. So um, exploring those values, um, we have many activities. Um, ideas from the resources, we highlight eight particular designs, but that's not um, a conclusive list. Um, but designs um, that we have on the site are those who've actually applied in our educational settings. Uh, we found that the drawing techniques uh, for the labyrinth in the resources have been a great way for children to actually align themselves more purposely and have a deeper connection to the experience. Um, heart labyrinths are again a, a strong focus for 2023 and especially um, for put the idea of post-reflection. Uh, we strongly um, encourage that in our schools, um, especially um, post-reflection when you have members of a group walk because it actually allows, we find that allows, especially with our students, allows them to respectfully wait for group members uh, to complete their walk. It certainly maintains a sense of unity and coherence um, to the activity, let alone that personal reflection. And we offer um, uh, reflection processes, some guides for that in the resources. Uh, some activities um, that we've encouraged kids to design their own labyrinths, um, as in that heart, the square one. Um, I, I call it the lollipop design. Um, if I can just focus the sort of things that we do is that um, the top row far right, uh, the student came in and said he felt grumbly, felt uneasy. Um, and he was just encouraged to simply um, draw a shape of how it feels. Within that, he then designed his labyrinth and used that labyrinth to really do that heart connection to his feelings. Um, and as it was in that case, um, a, a family problem. But that idea of well-being is certainly worthwhile. The um, Two middle labyrinths um, come from Louise Mason's um, uh, educational settings labyrinth logo. Um, it's used here for junior students where they actually can walk the labyrinth um, and they can actually choose to go in and out of it as long as they wish before they enter the larger extended centre down the bottom. And it's there where they can uh, draw a picture or write a reflection of that labyrinth experience. Um, the top slide is um, one that a school has used. Their theme, school theme for this year has been respect for self, others and the school. And um, the school decided um, to use two labyrinth designs. That simple one is for the um, junior kids, the five, six year olds. But every student in the school has prepared, coloured in their own labyrinth. They've been laminated and they sit in the students' um, chair bags or their desks to use for mindfulness or any time they're feeling a situation of stress. Um, the crazy one in the middle with that Cong the Congo almost design, um, I found that with five, the day I did that, the five-year-olds had no idea of turns. <laughs> and um, so we had a bit of a dance around the labyrinth following the track and they really quickly became um, familiar with it. And the second time round, not a problem. They knew where the turns were, uh, knew to wait in the centre. 
Um, and it's interesting that I, um, I'm an advocate for um, processional labyrinths in junior school. I took the risk that day with a, um, a normal labyrinth, not processional, and that was a learning. So we're always learning with labyrinths. Um, again, the lollipop designs and the bottom one in particular is um, I credit that to Maya Scott. She has a hand labyrinth and um, I've superimposed a, a, a cross between our traditional seed and the students actually following the seed draw their labyrinth within the hand labyrinth and can use that, that love tracing their own labyrinths, but it's internalizing that experience for them. Um, an offshoot again that's come out of that is um, I've had students who can't um, find their finger labyrinth and will actually use their hand and begin uh, with their deep breaths and follow um, their deep breathing through their finger until they get to the centre and do a few spirals till they find to their centre, close, breathe, and then simply follow the track back. So finger labyrinths, we now have a real understanding of hand labyrinths. Um, again, the idea here is using the labyrinth beyond um, World Labyrinth Day. Um, I was in a classroom with International uh, Women's Day and the, um, there are nine-year-olds here who uh, looked at the role of women and particularly focused on their mothers and did the finger labyrinth walk and they wrote a letter to their mum for International Women's Day, which they brought home. I think what's um, of particular interest for educators is the first one on the left-hand side. That was drawn by a child who is totally non-cooperative um, in an anger situation most time, ADHD, all those things, and um, simply walked that labyrinth all the way through, drew her picture of relationship with her mum and then tracked the dots of her tracking and her footsteps walking back. Uh, a great use for um, in the educational settings for wellbeing. So um, I hope that people can just see the great opportunities for educational settings as a kid. They're, um, they're our next generation for adult labyrinth walkers. So I just invite you to, um, to share some of those resources, I invite you um, in particular to, uh, to consider using those activities for adult, for groups or for self. Um, you know, it's more than just young students and young adults. And as I said, we, um, we are all learning. So I uh, thank you for and welcome feedback, please, on our website for anything that you may try. We're always, as I said, always learning. So um, back to you, Ellen. Thank you, Ange. Such beautiful work. Thank you for those wonderful stories from the kids too. It's I always find that really moving to see what they've done. And I highly encourage our viewers to um, go to the website and see all the resources. It's just amazing. And so many of these resources, as Ange has said, can be used with adults too. It's just um, amazing what they put together. So thank you. Thank you, Ange thank you. and Australian Labyrinth Network. Now I would like to introduce you to Chris Katzenmeyer, Thanks. who is the executive director of the Legacy Labyrinth Project. And she's gonna talk a little bit about um, how uh, intention and the research that, uh, the, that Legacy Labyrinth Project has done during the World Labyrinth Day that's called the Big Connection. So Chris, over to you. Thanks, Ellen. And hi, everybody. I am just so grateful to be here with my friends, uh, my labyrinth friends, and that you're all seeing on screen. Um, and I really hope that you're catching the labyrinth bug. <laughs> um, this is a lot of information, I know, uh, but it is really, really, um, I'd say, steeped and deeped in all of our hearts. And from the beautiful poem that you know, that Dana read at the very beginning to all of the work that the Australian Labyrinth Network has done and you know, our foundation of training that comes from Veritatis. Um, it's, it's just so rich, um, so rich. So I'm just very glad to be here and thank you for inviting us. You've heard so far many things about what a labyrinth can do, but it really isn't the labyrinth that is doing it. Um, it's really about the people and the energy of the people who are walking this sacred geometry um, that Dawn shared so well with all of us. And as Dawn also said, there's many ways to walk a labyrinth, and I'm here to share one more way. So one of the things that we do at the Legacy Labyrinth Project is we energetically connect 
uh, labyrinths together for the purpose of taking action to bring about global change. And the other thing that we do and are continuing to explore are um, really looking at the significant impact that when groups walk labyrinths together with an intention, what happens? And this slide right here is just a, uh, I just say a graphic that's showing some of where uh, labyrinths are. We have um, eight in our network currently, and number nine will be coming in uh, September from Newfoundland. And what we do is we energetically um, and ritually connect these together. And we teach people how to take action together to bring about change that isn't possible in traditional ways. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but we have coined the term labyrinth activism, and um, you'll see why in just a few moments. Labyrinth activism is also sacred activism using, using labyrinths. So staying with this slide, um, I was always curious when we were, when I was taking, and all of us have taken the Veritas facilitator training, you know, we learned in that training that um, you can experience transformation, you personally, personal transformation on a labyrinth. And all of us have, all of us, you know, continue to um, seek and reach those, those depths of our own self, as uh, Dana pointed out in his poem. But I was always curious that if you could do that individually, what would happen if a whole bunch of people on a whole bunch of labyrinths, um, could they focus and have transformation like a global, uh, on a transformation on a global scale? Um, so really, we have been spending the last 10 years looking at that fact. And the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. And World Labyrinth Day is a really, really good example of that. I just wanted to point us to the bottom right here called the Big Connection. And Ellen mentioned that the Big Connection is a research project. Um, and the Legacy Labyrinth Project uh, partnered with Dr. Jocelyn McGee from Baylor University to um, to do the research on what would happen if people all over the world walked with the same intention at the same time um, together, collectively. We, we use that the word collectively. What would happen? What would we see? What would we find out? What would we learn? So in 2021, the first Big Connection research project we did, we had 600 people register for it from around the world. I think it was 23 different countries. And we gave this intention, I'll read it in just a moment, to all of those folks to walk with on World Labyrinth Day. And the intention was, I am open to receive the information necessary to change myself and the planet. So if you can imagine, as Ellen pointed out, um, at uh, one o'clock in your time zone, everyone was walking with this intention. And right before they walked with this intention, they did what we call a heart brain meditation, which you saw in Angie's pictures, all those kids with their hands on their hearts and doing that meditation. Um, if you do that meditation, you walk with your intention. We <laughs> found out many things and some very surprising things as well. If we had to boil down everything that all is the uh, statistically significant findings we had, this one was really the summary. We found out that the practice of collective labyrinth walking, that means groups of people walking a labyrinth together with a shared intention, the one like I just shared with you, can lead to a sense of connectedness through a transcendent or sacred experience that may spur insights and ideas for addressing human suffering with compassionate action. So I'll back up because it's a lot of words, but we did find that 72% of the people in that particular um, study, 72% experienced this as a sacred experience. Almost, I would almost 92%, uh, I think it was 92.3 or something percent, um, felt connected to each other, whether that was each other on the labyrinth, each other around the world, 
um, connected to each other through the earth or through the experience. They had a sense of connectedness, a, um, a strong sense of connectedness. And as they were walking with that intention, um, they were receiving information. Um, information was emerging. And that was the part that we were totally not prepared <laughs> to find. And over 62% reported that they felt like they wanted to take some sort of compassionate action based upon the information they received while walking a labyrinth collectively. We were blown away by that. Um, this was during COVID, so that probably did have a lot of play in here. But we wanted to make sure we were, you know, hearing this in a consistent way. So we replicated this study two more times. And, um, and then we did a smaller study too um, outside of World Labyrinth Day. And we found completely similar um, results. If you wanna read more about the, the research itself, it's right down here. It's in the Journal of Frontiers in Psychology. It's the November issue of 2023. For me, this is, this is why I do what I do. <laughs> And why I encourage people to walk labyrinths, um, why I encourage people to be able to at least embrace that uh, we can use labyrinths to, to transform um, things globally, ourselves personally, our communities. Um, and Coretta Scott King, I think, says it the best. She says, the greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate action of its members. And we're learning day by day, really, the, the groups that are using and walking with intention work um, for social issues and, and doing it in a very meditative and compassionate way <clears throat> are finding out so many things about not only themselves, but their group itself. They're finding out their connection to the intention itself. And they're finding out that um, when we do this globally, like we do on World Labyrinth Day, uh, we do make a change, and it has. It is now, um, and we will continue to to research what that change is. So, when Ellen said in the very beginning, you know, that we walk for peace and that we make impact, she's entirely right, and we have the research to prove it. And we will continue to do this research because um, this is an untraditional way, a very untraditional way of doing activist work to address social issues of the world. And I can say here very clearly and, and proudly that it does. So if that um, resonates with you in any way, please come to our website. We would love to have you. We do a monthly, Ellen does a monthly um, walk with intentions called the Labyrinth Activist Network. It's, it's free and you can come and practice with us with intention. So I'm hooked. <laughs> I'm hooked on labyrinths, and I hope something that you've heard here today has hooked you as well, because it's it's good stuff. Thank you. We like to say that uh, powerful change can happen peacefully. So thank you, Chris. That was wonderful. Um, so I hope that the viewers have seen the the who, what, where, when, why, and how of World Labyrinth Day. You've gotten some history. You've seen how it's used in schools. You've seen how the research has shown that it's effective. And I wanted to take a few minutes to take you to that website we've been talking about. So that if you're thinking, well, I want to be a part of World Labyrinth Day, you absolutely can. And we've made it as easy as possible for you to create an event and by event, that could just be you walking a labyrinth by yourself, you joining in another event, or creating an event yourself. It's very, very simple. It doesn't need to be complicated. So the website that we've been telling you about, worldlabyrinthday.org, is right here on the page. This is the um, home page. And instead of taking to the, you to the website, I just screenshot took screenshots of a few pages to show you. So when you go, you'll be familiar. This is the homepage. If you scroll down farther, there's a couple of videos on there. Um, you can see the tabs at the top that will take you to different things. Just so you're familiar, you'll know you'll be at the right place when you go there. 
At the um, community calendar, this is a very robust page. It's under World Labyrinth Day 2024, and you'll see um, community calendar. This is where you could find an event in your area. You can see at the bottom of this screenshot that I, you can just see the part that says Africa, Americas, and Oceania. But if you go down, you will see other subcategories, and you click on that. Events that people have submitted are listed there for you to find. If you decide to create an event, please click that top blue button, submit an event, and let us know where you're going to be walking. Even if it's going to be by yourself, maybe somebody would like to join in if they know where you are. And, um, you know, it'll it, everyone around the world can see that. So you, it will also take you to the Facebook page that Carmel mentioned before that we have over 20,000 members and you can hear about events there. Um, there are virtual events um, that are listed too for people who you could put together a finger labyrinth walk with friends if you would like. But this is the important part too. After World Labyrinth Day, we would love to have you fill out the participation survey so that we know where you participated in World Labyrinth Day, how many people were involved, because it's fun to see the growth that has happened over the years, and we like to keep those statistics. And also, if you would like to submit one photo at the submit a photo, you might be included in our photo montage. At the end of the um, this, you will see our 2023 photo montage. This page is our resources and PR materials. And this is where we really make life easy for you. Above what you're seeing, there are logos that you can download to put on materials that you're creating. There's even a blurb that you can put into a newsletter already written for you. If you'd like to publicize this in your church or wherever you have a newsletter happening. If you can see the local event flyer, that's a template that you could fill in with your own information. There's also a press release also created that you can send to your media in your area. We have tips for creating an event and um, we have a timeless flyer that as Carmel mentioned, we have, I think now we're up to 12 languages. If you could go to the next slide. And this shows you how many different languages we have even in different formats. We really have tried to make an effort to welcome everyone around the world and to let you know that we want everyone to participate. We're working on a few more ideas for next year too, so stay tuned. We have created pre World Labyrinth Day events that happened the first Saturday of January, February, March, and you still have time to sign up for the April event, as you can see on the screen. This is just a one hour webinar that will help you give you ideas. Um, I know that this webinar will help you create an event and just, just share ideas with other people about what they're doing. We offer them two different times so that we cover almost every time zone around the world. Another attempt for us to make everyone feel welcome globally. And on the day of World Labyrinth Day, we have two events that you can join in. At 1 p.m. Eastern time, we have a finger labyrinth walk that's hosted by the Reverend Dr. Lauren Artris and Berita Toss hosts, hosts that. And then at 5 p.m., we have World Labyrinth Day Live that is just kind of a wrap up of the day. I can tell you for me, when I wake up on World Labyrinth Day, I'm in the central time zone. I'm outside of Chicago. It feels like Christmas morning because it's already happened in New Zealand and it's coming, the wave is coming my way and I can't wait. So by five o'clock, it's happened almost everywhere. We do touch tone with Hawaii to see what they're doing. Um, and it's really fun just to check in and see how the day went for everyone. So we wanted to take a few moments to see if anyone had any questions or comments. We have about five minutes to do that. Susie, I don't know if there's anything in the chat or. Oh, just real quick, we have a network of over 90 uh, regional reps uh, throughout the world. And I know we have several in California. I'm thinking of Katie Bull would mm -hmm. be the regional rep that's probably closest to LA. Um, we can certainly connect you with her. But I, the best thing to do is perhaps get with me if, if uh, Susie wants to put 
you know, my uh, contact information, you know, in the chat, just email me and we'll get you connected. There are already several walks listed for LA. I think Katie's already submitted them. Yeah. So I think there are three or four walks. If you go to the website and the page that I showed you, the community calendar, and you go under um, USA where California is, you'll see some walks that are already listed and hopefully something's near to you. Right. And then just get involved with that group because they're, they're movers and shakers out there. They're change mm-hmm. makers. They're real change makers out there. So, yeah. You know, you've talked some about what you get out of walking a labyrinth, but if you haven't walked a labyrinth before and you find a labyrinth in your community, or like if you're up in San Francisco and you go to Grace Cathedral, uh, what what are the what are the benefits of, of doing this? Why? What do you, what do you what do you get out of it? It's it's different every time. It's uh, unique to the individual, and it's different every time. Um, and it depends on a lot of different things. Uh, it depends on your frame of mind when you enter. It depends on maybe even the setting of the labyrinth. You know, sometimes people don't like so much to walk labyrinths with lots of people. Some people love to walk labyrinths with lots of people, you know, so that that can have bearings sometimes too. You know, one of the things that I enjoy a lot about first timers to labyrinths is watching them just sit by a labyrinth for a while, just sit and meditate with the energy of that labyrinth and maybe even have them watch people walk the labyrinth for a while. Um, just to kind of get a sense of the rhythm and a sense of how they're feeling about it at, at the time. But, you know, I know Dr. Artris teaches us all that don't expect to get, you know, shazammed. <laughs> don't expect to get that lightning <clears throat> bolt of, you know, you know, downloaded spiritual information, you know, um, every time or any time. Just walk and stay present. Just stay in the present moment and allow whatever wants to come through, um, come through. And walk more than once, definitely. I think it's a whole continuum. Um, We've heard people say, say, nothing happened. I just feel peaceful. Well, Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) peaceful is good. Um, And, uh, you know, at the other end of the continuum, we've had people experience some physical healing through the labyrinth. And... um, We don't talk about that much because it sets up an expectation in people, but it certainly is possible. So I remember walking the labyrinth um, for grief purposes the year that my father passed away of cancer. It was my sacred place to go as much as a sacred place as going to Lourdes or Fatima or Stonehenge. Um, or Glastonbury, you know, um, to me, it was the place to go and walk. And I um, was able to grieve in such a gentle way. And I felt very held by the, by the surroundings of the labyrinth and the labyrinth itself. So Dawn in her presentation talked about many different ways, using it for ceremony, using it for reconciliation, you know, for um, discernment, for prayer, worship, dance, all all of those reasons. The same reasons you pray, meditate, walk in the woods are the same reasons you walk the labyrinth. Are there any sources that you can think of for forming an, an intention that are secular? It's used in businesses often. Um, people, you know, will take, a, I've seen businesses go on, uh, like retreats together to do, um, vision casting, you know, to doing st- strategic planning and you can use the labyrinth just to, um, sort of upshift and downshift creativity and, and intuition that goes into, oftentimes goes into the next step of where the company might grow into so and to create group coherence yeah group mm-hmm. coherence absolutely yeah. Mm-hmm. Like yeah the same reason you fall back into someone's arms you know if mm-hmm. you've ever done that exercise it's it's you can use that as well yeah and i think basic coherence i think you're totally right alan 
um, it's an energetic thing <laughs> and you, you can start it by meditating together or saying a prayer together or just standing and holding hands together. But coherence is like an, you're, you're combining and you're getting coherent in your energy and a labyrinth for a group is perfect for that. Now, whether it's a business group or a church group or a kid's group or any kind of group, when you get in coherent energy with each other, um, there is a definite um, impact to that group. And it's definitely worth discussing afterwards as well. And, and not to mention using it, using the labyrinth in the 12 steps. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Right. And in prisons too, Ellen, in prisons yep. as well. That's, yes, that's quite secular. We could have a whole show on that, Dana. <laughs> we, we, you know. we, we actually had a question about using it in hospitals. And I mentioned to uh, uh, hospitals and memory care and rehab. And many people are using them in those um, those locations. Yes. Yes, John Hopkins has, um, uh, has a um, labyrinth in one of their facilities mm -hmm. in, in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Are they generally public? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I mean, yeah. accessible, mm -hmm. like you can just, if you see a labyrinth, you can just go walk it. Yeah. Typically, mm -hmm. yes. Usually. Usually. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I would say probably 80%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would be, uh, one of the things that I do, because I just love, looking for labyrinths, visiting labyrinths. So I go around and visit labyrinths and probably about 80 cent. And, and I recommend this to everybody. If you do use the labyrinthlocator.com, by the way, um, just call the contact number for the, the labyrinth. People love to hear that you are walking their labyrinth. So that's a good way to just make a connection. At the threshold between Santa Monica and Venice, California, there was a, an open park area. And I realized if there were a labyrinth at that particular space where that little tiny park is, and it's not a huge space, it would be such a symbol of nonviolence. It would just be the kind of thing that if you, if you just walked by it, it would it would slow your walk or if you went on there it, you might take a moment and walk it the symbol i'm looking at the labyrinth behind dawn and it just feels symmetrical coherent it has it creates invitation yes you know, another secular uh, usage, um, we've had a student intern with us and she walked at the beginning of the semester to, you know, set her intention for the semester. And then at the end uh, of the semester, walked it to uh, have closure about that semester. So mm -hmm. at that uh, many higher education campuses uh, have put in labyrinths for that very reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. Say more about that yeah. setting a intention. How important is it to set an intention? I'm going to defer <laughs> to Chris on this one. <laughs> it's not. But, and I, I find myself funny saying that because that's what we're studying is intent walking with intention but um it's not necessary to walk a labyrinth with an intention um the work that we're looking at is what happens when you align energetically with that intention in a labyrinth what is the impact of that um and that's just one way to walk a labyrinth so i would say it's not important to walk a labyrinth with an intention but it's it sure is interesting <laughs> and can be powerful and can be very powerful especially in a group well, yes like with a lot of things you may discover the intention after you learn the language of the labyrinth yes and, and, yes. and the labyrinth will then talk with you you know uh mm -hmm. and it has it seems to me that it uh it it brings forth a voice 
that you had inside you, but you didn't know you had. Yes, it's that's perfectly said, perfectly said. And, and there's something to be understood, and this happens after you walk labyrinths more than once, is that there is an energetic alignment with, with the geometry of the labyrinth. And in that space, you there is learning. There is definite learning um, in from the inside and wh wherever your learning is coming from. But yes, it's it's that energetic alignment that the intention can really help facilitate, as we're finding. Might be a good time to talk about our previous. Yes, so I was just yes, yes. <laughs> so Carmel promised that she was going to do our free World Labyrinth Day intention with us. And uh, Carmel's going to do the intention and then we're going to show the video from 2023 after that. So stick with us. So pass it over to Carmel. Well, thank you, Alan. So this practice is intended to prepare all of the participants, venues and labyrinths for World Labyrinth Day. We're seeking to prepare our own hearts and those of all who will walk for peace and planetary healing on World Labyrinth Day. We join our intention to connect and prepare in advance the venues and labyrinths that will be used and to raise awareness of the event worldwide. So we're gonna ask that you join us in this uh, practice of intention this evening. I'm gonna lead you through a brief guided meditation just to bring us all together in this moment and then I'm going to read the intention for you. So if you could just in your own faith tradition, in your own practice, start to just settle yourself down. Often people call it centering, grounding. Um, let's start on the inside. So sit in a comfortable position, straighten your back, go ahead and close your eyes. Relax your face, drop those shoulders, notice your surroundings and be present to it. Then with a few deep cleansing breaths, let's inhale and exhale together, taking a deep breath in. And on that exhale, let go of all of the thoughts and feelings and body sensations that are keeping you from relaxing and being present to this practice now. Let's take another deep breath in. Taking as much breath as you can, filling your lungs to the very bottom. Go ahead and exhale with a whoosh. And one last time together, cleansing breath in, relaxing breath out. Think about those who will walk on World Labyrinth Day. Picture in your mind the thousands of labyrinths around the world being connected energetically. Think of our legacy labyrinths and our sacred sites being connected energetically. Notice the beating of your own heart. Let go of active thinking. Empty your mind and welcome spaciousness. Continue your deep breathing, quieting your mind, connecting to your heart space. Feel your cleansing breath, unifying your whole being. Feel love expand. Let love flow into and from your heart space. Welcome, welcome this embodiment as a peaceful shining light within you and all around you. Welcome gratitude. And perhaps placing your hand on your heart as an act of anchoring into your heart space. Continue breathing slowly and consciously, settling deeper into your heart space. As we move into our intention, I will read it three times. This first time, listen deeply. 
the hosts, participants, and all labyrinths are connected in peace and planetary healing on World Labyrinth Day. On the second reading, repeat it to yourself. The hosts, participants, and all labyrinths are connected in peace and planetary healing on World Labyrinth Day. And on this third time, let it be entrained, let it become a part of you, let it sink in. The hosts, participants, and all labyrinths are connected in peace and planetary healing on World Labyrinth Day. Amen. May it be so. And we hope that you will continue practicing this intention as we lead up to May 4th. Beautiful. Thank you, Carmel. And we would like to have you see a little bit of World Labyrinth Day by showing you our photo montage from 2023. Falling to the water's dead I am waiting For the fullness of your face To guide me What can I hold on to?
hope that gives everybody some ideas of what the possibilities are. You saw people walking alone. You saw huge groups. You saw labyrinths that were made just for World Labyrinth Day. You saw labyrinths that had been there for the ages. So anything is possible. I share with my good friend, Will Lynn, that we and the Myth Salon are really honored that we could participate in this, that we could lend our support. Um, I don't, I don't know what I expected, but this has been a beautiful, warm, fuzzy for me. Aww, and you. you know, and I, I, I have to give a shout out to uh, a fellow Dennis Hall. He's, he's in the audience out there somewhere. And you know, if he hadn't embarked upon this dissertation project at Pacifica Graduate Institute and successfully completed it, I might add, it was magical. I mean, I learned so much about the history and phenomenology of labyrinths that they go back thousands and thousands of years. And we are all the echoes of our ancestors. Of, of history speaking out through us. And so it's, it's just a little way that each of us can keep history alive by walking these labyrinths this way, finding one that um, evokes some sense of the timeless, that through eternity, the particulars of whatever, whether it's secular or divine, they, they come forth and it's existence speaking to us. Uh, we might even say it's, it's the way the Tao express, expresses itself. So, Will, maybe you would say something. They, they're sure. looking at what well, <clears throat> comments. Uh, doesn't he say anything? This has been great. I've, it's been great to listen. I, I think a lot of that's uh, what the labyrinth is about, right? Um, but I would say, one thing that's standing out to me that, that I might share is um, going back to um, the Corinne, Corinne, right? Oh, so yeah. if we go back to Corinne writing about Crete. Um, he writes about the labyrinth and in there, he says that the labyrinth actually, according to him, started as a dance floor and that it was only later that you built up these walls. And one of the things that really struck me looking at these images that, that y'all just shared is that sometimes it's hard to tell where the walk which what's the walkway and what's the path what's the line being drawn and what's the like i'm watching them walk on the grass part of the labyrinth and i'm like wait but i thought that the groove and so there's this confusion between what's the path and what's the line and that takes it back to uh you know of course in the mythological labyrinth there's the line there's zoe there's the actual thread that we're going in and out uh, in and out with and zoe of course represents that thread of life which when you go back to that era of the dance floor, it's representing that thread of enlivened movement. And so to me, I just was really struck by the kind of odd coincidental uh, visual confluence of the lines and the boundaries, the empty space and the space and this kind of um, ambiguity between it both being this kind of guided path um, but also um, a liberated path, a path where it's, you know, just a dance floor. And I don't know. And with that, I thought I, one of the questions I was holding back earlier, I would, I would love to hear, you know, for us, we come at all this stuff from the space of mythology. Um, so I am curious for anybody here that's part of our more usual conversation around mythology, what you might say to them about how mythology is relevant to y'all with the labyrinth, uh, if it's what you might bring from mythology into your experiences, if you encourage people engaging in labyrinths to uh, engage in the myths, if it actually helps them go deeper into the experience to have had those experiences with myths. So I guess, you know, if, if it's not too late, I'd love if you had any thoughts that you could share about how myth in the labyrinth might come into what y'all are doing. You know, the, the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. A lot of people will relive that and all this, all the archetype and the sim, uh, symbolic um, nature of that particular story. And of course, I think it's the crane dance that you might be uh, referring to as the dance floor. And we do indeed dance on the labyrinth. Mm. It's beautiful, beautiful. Yes. Uh, 
you know, processional <laughs> dance on the labyrinth. I wish we did more of it. Um, mm. Also, the beautiful book that Lauren has written um, about, it's a called a Dawn Percival Fool's Holy Venture. The Holy Fool. The Holy Fool. I mean, that's all about the search of the grail. And, that, and we know that's um, myth history. They call it myth history with all of that. But Dawn, maybe you could talk a little bit about, about um, the Holy Fool. Well, you know, it's such a good question about the mythology in the labyrinth. And I think that the labyrinth um, goes so far back uh, before written history that we don't actually know. We don't have, um, you know, why was it put in a cave in, in the particular uh in the in the classical shape uh, why you know um we don't know who made this incredible pattern in the floor of 1201 um so there's so much we don't know you can take the myth of of theseus and and the ariadne and the thread um, but if you do that, you're freezing in time um, a, a bit of how the world was seen. And mm -hmm. I think that the, the classical labyrinth and then the short labyrinth, I think they are energy fields. And um, whatever is the prevailing myth of the time gets um, it becomes a part of the energy field, so to speak. So, um, of course, we could have a much longer discussion about this. But one of the things that we do teach in Veriditas is to take everything that happens in the labyrinth as a metaphor mm. so if you get lost in the labyrinth you might ask yourself where am i lost in my life where am i lost on this path um if you feel joy in the center um you know what's the metaphor that resonates with that feeling of joy um so it's rather than, you know, having a myth uh, come down on it, I think that come down on the, the sacred pattern, that it is there for us to make of it what we will. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that, <laughs> I hope that's not, no, that was great. You're like saying, like, keep it a dance floor. Don't let it turn into a, a there you prison. Go. Don't yeah. box it in. Don't box it in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's that uh, because, and both. It's all get, that and more, Will. That's right. If you get stuck in in the myth of that one error and one time, sure, you can make sense out of it that you know, in our center, there is a beast we have to overcome um, on the path of life in, in order to uh, move ahead. But, uh, but keep on dancing and see what happens. Yeah. And Will, you might want to ask yourself about those lines and those paths. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Right. You Do you guys get excited when you... to you? There might be something it's telling you. Thanks. Yeah, the negative space is important to me. I, I, always. I think yeah. um, always overlooked by definition. Do you guys get excited when you see the labyrinth like in a TV show like Westworld or Olympus or... Yes. Yeah, okay. yes. Yeah. And we call yes, each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> text. That's and, awesome. And articles yeah. and, and what have you. There's a lot of good articles lately been written and you know, we're always texting that. And, and so when you saw like the, the labyrinth tattoo on the inside of the brain area, right? In Westworld, like <laughs> you, it, there's so much, it's such a cool symbol. And so, and it's actually 
amazing to see it come in and use the way that it is. Obviously, uh, Inception and Ariadne and everything there. Um, that's fun. It would be amazing just to do like a labyrinth, like screening series or something like that. Yeah. It, it can be misused too, Will. You have to do your fact checking as well. Mm. You know, this program emerged out of a conversation, series of conversations that Lauren Artress and I had, where we had four different programs that we were going to do on the labyrinths. And then we started with this and we realized that let's get this thing going. We'll do this thing today. And the other two, uh, they'll be coming probably over the summer. I mean, she's all she's all primed to do it, but uh, this has impact, and it has it has the sense that as you plant a seed and you watch it grow, it just takes nurturing and patience and time and soil. I'm I'm really grateful and honored, deeply honored, to have had this labyrinth world enter my world because it it brings up sensibilities that that obviously I had and that tapped into the thing that made it resonant with the labyrinth itself. So Carmel, Chris, Ellen, Anj. <laughs> okay, and Scott and Don and Will and Susie. Wonderful afternoon. Well, I'm and, sure we're going to be seeing more of you. I know you and I have some things planned for for later on in August, and um, we do. We're just, we're just thrilled um, to to come into Myth Salon world as well. Now, I've been Welcome. following you for a couple of years, but um, it's it's a beautiful a connection, just ex expansion of family is how I it look is. At it. it is and, yeah community. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being mm -hmm. part of a Thank wonderful you, Dana. Warm Thank you. for the Thank you, Dana. World what a joy. Thanks, Dana. God. Okay. So, good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Good